All right, here's the regulatory and standards bodies. Um, there's the ITU, the International Telecommunication Unit, and the ISO, International Standards Organization. Uh, they provide standards. Then there's organizations underneath those like the EIA, Electronics Industries Association, the Telecommunication Industry Association, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and then the Electric International Electrotechnical Commission, uh, the Frame Relay Forum, ADSL Forum, ATM Forum, and PLS Forums. All those might have forums underneath that um, serve as focus groups for the different standards. So obviously without standards, you can't have systems that communicate to each other. So standards are essential for, for this stuff. Uh, luckily, that's all we talk about as far as the standards bodies, because there's not too much to say. We need to talk about the, um, the bands and how things go. These somewhat crazy pictures, <laughs> animated GIFs, are showing waves propagating. Uh, this one on the left is, is what might sort of uh, serve as a wave propagating through some sort of material. So when you receive a, a radio wave, you're not receiving um, part the actual particles that were emitted from a source, but you're receiving the vibrations that have moved through the substrate. Um, so sound is, is air pressure moving through, but you're not actually moving. Uh, you're not actually receiving the air molecules from the area. You're receiving the, the vibrations as they go through. Uh, some waves are, of course, moving, moving particles. Um, electromagnetic radiation is what we're talking about, and that's another name for light, but not just visible light that we can see, but lower energy light like radio waves and higher energy like X-rays and gamma rays. Uh, light is an electromagnetic wave. And this one on the right is an overhead view showing the same thing. So you can see these particles are just moving back and forth, but in doing so, they're propagating energy through them in the form of waves. All right, don't stare at that too long. Electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave is a traveling electric and magnetic field disturbance. The changing electric field produces the magnetic field, and the changing magnetic field produces the electric field. Very, very strange interaction of these two phenomena. You may be familiar that when a magnetic field changes, it moves electrons. That's the basis for an electric generator. Well, that is the rough idea of electromagnetic waves, except these guys actually launch. <laughs> Don't need a wire to go through the air. Pretty amazing stuff. And the waves are at right angles to each other. So what we're trying to see here is an orange sine wave in the vertical direction and a purple magnetic sine wave in the um, horizontal direction. OK. Uh, the frequency of those waves determines their propagation properties, um, and so we're interested in different ones. So the electromagnetic spectrum is the range of all possible frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. The electromagnetic spectrum extends from below the low frequencies used for modern radio communication up to gamma radiation at the short wavelength and high frequency end. So there's an inverse relationship between the wavelength, in other words, how long it takes to repeat, and the frequency. Higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So down at the low end, we, we've got radio waves that are uh, sometimes many hundreds or even a thousand meters long. These ones tend to um, propagate very well along the surface of the Earth. And so they're used for some sort of some sorts of military communication that doesn't have line of sight. Then we get into microwaves. Um, the wavelength here, 10 to the minus 2, if you notice that's longer, uh, larger than the size of the holes in the metal mesh that is on the front of microwaves to allow you to see the contents. And that's why the microwaves don't come out at you, even though you can see through that metal mesh. The mesh is a smaller wavelength than the microwave itself. Then we start getting into light. This is infrared light. 
and it's only called something different because our eyes are able to pick up this sort of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so same stuff, just we have a different relationship with it because of our sensors, our eyeballs. Then we get into normal visible light, then ultraviolet light. Now these are just examples of the, uh, the scale ultraviolet light has a wavelength that's on the uh, so small it's on the molecular size. Then we get into x-rays. So more visible, or sorry, higher frequency than visible light are these guys on the right. And uh, they also will have a association in your mind with damaging human tissue. So ultraviolet light, uh, as the frequency goes up, the energy contained in the that disturbance, that electromagnetic radiation goes up as well. So ultraviolet light has the ability to ionize, which is uh, another word for knocking electrons off of things. And when you can knock the electrons off of things, you can change their chemistry. And when you can change their chemistry, you can upset DNA replication. So, so that's why we associate things like ultraviolet rays, x-rays, and gamma rays with cancer and other harm, burns and stuff like that to people because it can actually change the, the material it, it hits. Infrared light, invisible light, we're used to um, causing heat when it hits things because it simply causes a vibration of the molecules when things get things absorb it. And of course microwaves cause heat as well, but that causes uh, a vibration of the water molecules within the substance. Interestingly, um, there's another scale down here of temperature, and this is because a body, an object, will emit radiation as it heats. Uh, so we can see that infrared radiation is admitted, emitted by objects when they're up from uh, absolute zero of negative 273 degrees Celsius. So anything above absolute zero, which means no molecules are moving, uh, there's some electromagnetic radiation emitted. And we get into visible radiation in here being emitted, and that's why incandescent light bulbs work, and the sun works, and hot things are visible to us. You may notice that your monitor and other things have a color temperature you can adjust. And so that's it. it that's the temperature in Kelvin that you often see. That basically just changes the color of your, of your monitor, how white or how blue or reddish the light color is. Okay, so objects emit radiation, electromagnetic radiation is the heat as well. And the hotter they are, the higher the re electromagnetic radiation. All right, it's hard not to have complicated diagrams for, for this because it's uh, so wide that it's very chopped up. So this is a linear scale of electromagnetic uh, frequency allocation in the U.S. from 3 kilohertz all the way up to 300 gigahertz. So if we were to zoom in on these bits, we would see um, the actual usage. So for example, in here we've got maritime mobile being used along with something else that I can't quite read. Maritime mobile shows up in a lot of parts around here. Uh, here's radio location. So these are all pieces that have been allocated for different services. And it's sort of a resource. This is sort of real estate. And when they open up a new portion of the spectrum or reallocate, they actually open it up for auction for industries and companies to bid on getting uh, certain chunks of this spectrum allocated to them for their service that they'd like to provide. A lot of money in being able to control what electromagnetic radiation gets sent at these different frequencies. And of course, it's illegal to transmit in any of these frequencies that you're not allocated or not licensed for because that ruins everything for everybody. It's a commons, basically, electromagnetic spectrum. Well, to get any use out of something like that, we really have to zoom in and look at uh, particular portions of it. So here's a a view of um, uh, the gigahertz range from slightly below a gigahertz up to three gigahertz. 
And you can see that there's just all sorts of stuff allocated to different spots in here. Uh, we have RFID allocated way down here. Um, that stands for radio frequency identification. Those are those little tags that they put under the skin of animals, probably soon to be under the skin of humans. <laughs> well, they need to be tracked like some bad sci-fi movie. Um, they're also putting those tags on all sorts of objects and stuff that allows them to communicate close by with, with uh, readers. Uh, we see also in here SCADA, which is supervisory control and data, which is basically telemetry stuff. GMRS, which is general mobile radio service, like UHF radios and the family radio service radios. And then we see cellular or mobile phones, sat phones, have their own little, little spectrum bits here. And the uh, one I've left off so far is ISM, which is industrial, scientific, and medical. Um, lots of stuff that isn't really industrial, scientific, and medical ended up here, like Bluetooth. Um, and cordless phones, and even Wi-Fi is in there sometimes. As you can see, there's multiple places ISM shows up, as well as multiple places cellular phones and statcoms, cell phones show up. That's all just because of how the allocations work and their attempts to uh, plan for people. There are different propagation uh, properties associated with these different frequencies, so that's why you'll see one service get frequencies in different parts. Uh, it's possible that sat phones have a hard time here with some sort of natural or man-made interference, and so it'll be good that there's other uh, parts of the spectrum they can hop to to do their communication. Uh, you can zoom in on other parts like the 2 to 6 gigahertz and see other stuff in here, more ISM stuff. And I don't actually know what Hyperlan or NII is. Do you guys know what either of those are? NII or Hyperlan? If you're trying to Google any of these, it's pretty safe to do, for example, NII band, because there's um, lots of things usually abbreviated the same thing, and no musicians labeled them, so you usually find what you need. It's the Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure Radio Band. That tells us something. You know what? That's going to be Wi-Fi, I bet, because, um, yeah, originally limited to indoor use. Let's see where it's actually being used. Wireless ISPs generally use that. So that might be the point-to-point -point wireless internet stuff we're getting rolled out here in Australia. Anybody else know what that area gets used for? I know my uh, cordless phones in the house use around the 5 gigahertz range. Yep, there you go. And Wi-Fi as well, 802.11 stuff. So countries can allocate what gets used for all these, by the way, to very few of them are, um, and not all of them are international. Okay, so there you go. I still don't know what Hyperland is. Let's look that one up real quick. Hyperland is going to be an 802.11 thing, I bet. Land being local, local area network, as in computer network. Dual band Wi-Fi, yeah, let's see. Wireless stand, wireless LAN standard, 54 megahertz bits per second rate. That's actually fairly low. It's a U European alternative to the IEEE 802.11. Oh, that's what we need is competing and battling standards. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, okay, so it's uh, like 802.11, but not because they wanted to do something different. All right, there you go. And this is what the, the band looks like when we zoom in on stuff, so um, even further. And you can see some stuff is dually allocated because maybe it's not going to interfere with the other, the other one, or maybe it's allocated different things in different countries. So fairly densely packed, right? But there's, in this case, 5 megahertz of... Um, 
space between these two things. So that's plenty for the circuitry to be able to differentiate between those different frequencies. Satellite stuff is in here, radio astronomy, space research, um, satellite stuff. So space research being passive means they're just listening on these frequencies. And um, in a way, it's too bad that there's not more allocated to this because if some Yahoo has their mobile phone near your huge radio astronomy installation where you're trying to listen in on this band, you're likely to get smashed and not be able to detect extraterrestrial life far away. Uh, what else to say? Amateur radios in here. Anyway, you get the idea. It's uh, partitioned out into stuff. Uh, and the point of this slide is that this is where the ISM stuff is. All right. Now, within these bands, even more tightly broken up um, are the channels. So, for example, here's IEEE 802.11b wireless LAN stuff. And they'll, they will use these frequencies here, actually, sorry, this frequency, centered on this frequency with some width to it. Uh, they'll use that for channel 1, this for channel 6, this for channel 11. The idea is that you can have multiple devices working on the same standard in the same frequency allocation uh, nearby each other, and they'll detect the other's presence and switch from one channel to another. So this is the allocation broken up even further into channels, and this is often um, up to the technology and the standards. So the band itself, the whole band is allocated but the technology and the devices will pick channels within that. So this is a, a chart representing frequency on the x-axis and energy or amplitude in the, the y-axis. So the idea is that if you're sending, uh, if you're transmitting and receiving in here, there's none of the other channels bleeding into yours and interfering. So there's some space between these channels usually because the roll-off in transmitters is, uh, is not usually perfect. There's usually a bit of stuff coming in between here. Okay, so you may have seen channel allocations on a Wi-Fi box you're setting up, and of course on FM radios and stuff. That's why usually they're left to their own uh, abilities to switch around and pick a channel. Okay, um, more pictures of frequency allocations. We don't necessarily look at that any more closely than that. Um, so many types of wireless stuff. I'll try to fit in with these stuff. Uh, this is a, a picture showing the, the different distances that these different standards are intended to work on. Bluetooth and near field communications are all intended to be very close by, 10, 10, up to 10 meters. And then Wi-Fi, of course, is supposed to work some reasonable distance, in a range of tens to maybe 100 meters, if you're lucky. I had special antennas, ultra-wideband wireless stuff. This would be high data rate. WiMAX, which is intended for sort of cities. And mobile phones, of course. Lots and lots of wild wireless standards. Uh, here's just a list of some of the standards names and some of their common names for some of this wireless stuff. So 80211 is the Wi-Fi standard that you've got probably blasting you right now in your home or workplace, wherever you are. Bluetooth is probably also blasting you because most laptops and PCs and phones now can talk Bluetooth. A little hint if you want to get a device to last a little longer on a battery charge, turn off the Bluetooth. Uh, y Media, which I don't actually know what that is. Anybody know, anybody seen what that's used for? Y Media. Or Zigbee. I know I've heard of Zigbee, but not actually seen it on a device. Low data rate. Industrial sensors, what Zigbee's for. Anyway, SATCOM stuff, a lot of 802 standards, if you notice. WiMAX, which is the uh, metropolitan scale, probably wireless. 
etc. And there's even more. There's wireless SCADA stuff, walkie-talkies, CDMA and TDMA. This is mobile phones, GSM also mobile phones. In field communications, this is the stuff where you can tap your phone to other phones and they'll talk to each other. Wireless USB. Goodness, it just goes and goes, right? We love our wireless stuff. Complicated.